everybody. Welcome here. The verse of the day is from Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Andrew will be preaching today. This week on Wednesday morning, we have ladies' coffee. On Thursday, we have wings night. So the men will be going to Splatter's Paintball Driving Range to do golfing, and then to Hesper's in Niverville afterwards. The Bothwell Christian Fellowship has invited us to their 10-year anniversary celebration. That's on April, or uh, not in April, August 13th, two weeks. Um, on August 14th, we have the conference picnic at the park in New Bothwell. So Sam Dirks is going to be preaching that week. We're also going to have some of our missionaries there, not to do presentations, but just to be there to meet you. Like um, Rosa River is going to be there. Youth for Christ is going to be there. So that's Duane and Sylvia, and then Megan Friesen. Brett and Candice are going to be there. John Wheeler from the radio board. Mike Dirksen from St. Malo. So please come out. Have a chance to socialize with the missionaries and play some baseball. The missionaries of the week this week are Jacob and Karen. They're in Guelph. Keep them in your prayers. We need a superintendent for Sunday school. So if you can help out with that, we would really appreciate it. And sometimes we might be kind of scared that that's a full-time commitment. Well, that superintendent position would be. But if you're interested in teaching just one Sunday a month, even uh, please put your hand up and we can get you involved in any way that, that you're able to help. Um, read over the prayer list. There's quite a few names on there. And let's remember these people for us. We might see their name once a week and be reminded of them, but for them the struggle is every single day. So it's really important to, to keep these people in our prayers. That's all I have. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this long weekend. Lord, we thank you for the heat that you gave us yesterday and the cool that you gave us today. Lord, we know that you're the Lord over all things. And I ask that this long weekend, that we can be refreshed and we can see the weekend for what it is. It is a time to refresh and to slow ourselves down. And for those of us here this morning, we can slow ourselves down by spending time in your word and realizing the great things that you've given us. I want to pray for all the people that came here today, Lord, and they have the camaraderie and the community of the church, Lord. Uh, I thank you for providing that, and I hope they leave here uplifted. For the people watching online, Lord, they won't have that same interaction, but I ask that you still reveal yourself to those people and that they can still be inspired. And just the people in general that aren't here, Lord, please give them safety, and uh, may they see you and may they see your goodness. Lord, when we do look over this prayer list and we do see these names and we see some of the things that are going on in the world around us with people being displaced people experiencing these hardships from war or natural disaster or everything lord help us be reminded that these are your people and these are people that are fearfully and wonderfully made made in your image lord and and may we empathize with them and have compassion on these people lord just like you had on us when we were still sinners we are still sinners lord and and you saved us Lord, I want to pray for Andrew. Please speak through him today and, and also through the worship music that we can be inspired and motivated to be the light on the hill and the salt of the earth. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Good morning. Now that we've got a lot of people out canoeing and doing different things this weekend, uh, it's up to us to sing twice as loud to make up for all the missing people. Okay, deal? I know you're going to. <laughs> Let's sing Standing on the Promises, number 175. Let's stand and sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Every time I sing that song, or we sing that song, I'm reminded of John Banman asking the congregation are we standing on the promises or just sitting on the premises? And I think of that every single time we sing that song. <clears throat> All right, let's sing number 354, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. That's such a beautiful thought, that visual of him just taking us in his arms and shielding us. It's not that all that stuff isn't still happening. It's not that all that stuff isn't still terrible, but that he'll shield us and that he'll protect us and be with us and walk us through it. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful visual. Let's sing Take Time to Be Holy, number 376. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever betide, in joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Amen. Thank you for singing. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. 
Before I begin, I'm going to fulfill a promise here. Hi, Mom. Very good. All right. Uh, Richard also volunteered to be the canary in the, in the coal mine today. So if I'm losing you, he'll, he'll let me know. He'll be... Mm, no. <laughs> okay, so I want you to turn your Bibles with me. We're going back to Isaiah. And I want you to go to chapter 7. And I want you to follow along. And we're actually going to read verses 13 and 14. So in the book of Isaiah, back in the 8th century, this was before Christ, uh, we read about Isaiah the prophet. He was a man who God showed the future to, among other things. Uh, Isaiah had a big heart for God, and he was very obedient and a godly man. And he spoke to Israel after the exile regarding judgment and restoration of God's people back to God. That was sort of his purpose at that time. He was, you know, everyone sort of has a purpose. Uh, that was his, seemed to be his purpose. So for the house of David, he had a special message in the seventh chapter, starting in verse 13. So verses 13, 14. So let's read that. He said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, Isaiah was a very practical man. He saw the conflict between the Israelites that had returned to their homeland after the exile and saw the bitterness and fighting between his people. See, the people that came back from exile had returned and they were at odds with the stragglers that were left behind from them before, mostly fellow Israelites. So these people were all generations apart and uh, they weren't getting along. So Isaiah wanted his people united. That's, that was really on his heart at this time. And God wanted his people united as well. He always does. He always wants nothing less than everyone to get along. Now the Israelites should have placed politics and rhetoric aside to rebuild a nation. Isaiah was reminding him this. That God wanted to use as a center of power here on earth. God had big plans for the Israelites that just never came to fruition. Not because God isn't faithful. Not at all. Because people aren't faithful. Now it turns out this, this was never allowed to occur because the people always turned away from God. That's why it didn't happen. That's why they were disobedient. They just wanted nothing to do with God. Like a metaphor for the rest of the world turning away from God, the Israelites also usually wanted nothing to do with God. And like us, they were and are proficient at it. All humans are. I'm not picking on anybody or any kind of uh, group at all, but much to is Isaiah's dismay, he tries to enlighten them with the revelation that God will send them the Messiah, the Messiah, Emmanuel, which in their language meant God with us. God was planning to come down and rescue us personally. This was different. This was new. I'm sure it went in, or a lot of those people went in one ear and out the other. But much like the rest of the world, most of the Israelites ignored it. Now, too good to be true, so therefore, it probably wasn't. Because of this, the Israelites kind of basically went quiet for about 800 years. There's that whole period that we don't hear much from them. Now, we've all heard the phrase, you're not one of us. You've heard that phrase. We may have even heard it directed at us at one time or another. Who knows? We may have even used this. We possibly have used this, unfortunately, on someone else. A friend of mine had a business opportunity in Newfoundland years ago, and he moved there to take over a business. He was told, even after a few years of living there, that in essence, he would never become an actual Newfoundlander. If you weren't born there, you'd never become one. The idea is not new or unique to Newfoundland, of course. New York City has a similar ideology. You're not a New Yorker unless you grew up in the New York streets. You can move there when you're 20 and live there for 80 years and you're never a New Yorker. The same ideology can be said for almost any ethnic group, region, or even sports team here on earth. That's how we humans, unfortunately, seem to be wired. We can tell when someone comes from a big city and finds themselves in our timely ham a tiny hamlet, and it's almost like you can read their thoughts. It's like we can instantly tell that they've never been on a farm 
or lived in a tiny town. I have a, a girl at work. She moved here from Toronto, and it was a big adjustment for her. We humans are wired, it seems, to segregate, or at least see the segregation. We have a long history of it. I believe that this tendency to segregate is a byproduct of original sin. It's an easy way for Satan to divide us. He kind of puts that in there. In a weird way, it oddly seems to make sense to us at times to divide. Missionaries constantly report that the proverbial uphill battle many times because the people there that they're serving always kind of know that, well, you're foreigners still. They simply aren't one of them. So they, they can overcome it, and it takes a lot of trust, and it takes a lot of work, but, but it, it, is, it is something that's there, and almost all missionaries report that. I myself jokingly or joked after joining our church that I was now a Mennonite. The reality was that I wasn't born a Mennonite. Being a Mennonite is not a choice. There's a big argument on that, but it's in your DNA. You know, it's your culture that you're raised in. Now, Satan uses race segregation many times, regional segregation, political segregation, even religious segregation. That's funny. We believe in the same God, but we still don't agree on things. All sorts of segregation. And he, whatever he convince us, can convince us, that seems to make sense to us. It's a tool of sin that many times we don't even recognize as being sin. It seems like common sense sometimes. And that's not true. It seems like common sense to way too many people on earth at times, different, different situations over history. Once we choose to follow Christ, however, it's only then that we see everyone as equal in the eyes of God. It's only then that we have true compassion for our fellow human beings and we come alongside. Only through following Jesus Christ do we stop seeing skin color, ethnicity, political, or religious differences. It is Christ that is the melting pot. True communion with God can only work through Jesus Christ. So why is that? To understand us, we need to understand our human nature and tendencies in regards to segregation. To understand segregation is to understand the reasons we desire familiarity. Now, historically, and unfortunately, even in the present time, humans tend to lean towards segregation. Before we really get into this, I want to make sure and verify that everyone listening to me understands that segregation is wrong. just want to make this crystal clear. There's no such thing as good segregation when it comes to human terms. Now, yes, the Bible alludes to segregation of religious beliefs, and only religious beliefs in the Old Testament. There were crucial times in history that the Israelites were losing their identity and had forgotten all about God, and it was because they were marrying into pagan and atheist-style families. God suggests that they stop marrying and fraternizing with ungodly nations because he was losing his people. They were more and more getting farther away from God because you know, the truth was being muddled. If the Bible ever discussed situations where the Israelites should not marry into pagan, atheistic, or was at that time yet unnamed Islamic traditions, it was only to address Israel's sin at leaving God. It was very specific. He wasn't saying on a broad scale. He, but he was trying to talk about being equally yoked, and that meant, that meant belief. You can't find God or get back to God if you immerse yourself in a nation that practices worshiping an Asheron pole or, or worships a stone statue. If you've never heard of God, it's almost impossible to get back to God. You're not even aware that you lost God because no one's ever talked to you about God. So that, those are the times in the Old Testament that's what that was alluding to. God never talks about keeping ethnicity separate, however. He only addressed sin where they had turned from God, and the reason was intermarriage with non-believers. Non-believers. There's always a danger of that. A believer being with a non-believer. We always think that the believer is going to bring the non-believer up, and that happens. But it can also happen in the other way. A believer with a non-believer may just decide to stay home on a Sunday morning and stop going to church because it's easier. Now, it's similar to the concerns, like I say, that a parent would have with a Christian marrying a non-Christian or the danger being that the non-Christian may influence the Christian because it's easier to do that. 
Now that's all. And I hope that clarifies the biblical stories of, of what you might want to classify as segregation. But it was addressing sin. Now I'm talking this morning about humans' idea of segregation, which is very wrong. I don't know why, but we humans usually feel the need to separate people do, again, to race, skin color, male and female even. There's so many parts of the world where women aren't even equal to men. Uh, there's uh, different ideals, there's different religious trains of thought, and we seem to get caught doing this over the entire course of human history. It's an ugly byproduct, like I say, of original sin. Segregation started early. Adam's son was afraid of being segregated from God and his family after he killed his brother. Segregation, separation from family and groups has always been a punishment. Most normal people would find that to be a horrible punishment. We as humans usually need to belong. We need to bond to other people. It's very rare that a human craves no fellowship with anyone else. These people are, you know, emotionally broken, need help to rejoin society. That is a, a usual normal desire to be with people. We usually crave relationship, but it's when that relationship is defined with sinful definitions, well, that's where the ugliness of segregation comes in. Nobody is better than anybody else. That's the truth. And now I'm getting, I'm getting somewhere. Richard hasn't given me the thing yet. We crave relationship, but many times we tend to crave relationship with people similar to ourselves. We tend to look for the easier relationships, those relationships that revolve around where you were born, how you grew up, who you fraternize with. Sometimes that takes the shape of relationships with people you grew up with and nobody else. Anyone ever seen the movie Jaws? Don't necessarily recommend it. It's pretty, you know, there's a big shark. And, but the police chief in there, his name is police, police Chief Brody, he is schooled and corrected by his wife, since having moved from New York City to his now new home, Amity Island, which in reality was Martha's Vineyard, in which his wife informs him that he's not a true islander unless he was born an islander. Humans want to be part of something bigger than themselves, part of clubs. They want to feel special. When I first moved to Steinbeck, I was informed that I would never understand being a Mennonite because I wasn't born a Mennonite. People like familiarity. You light up a smile. You light up a, and smile when someone talks to you about uh, going to the same high school as you did. We gain a new interest when we find out someone has the same hobbies as we have. Common interests and common backgrounds give us uh, a, a, a sense of a comfort. Uh, it, it's just we understand people a little easier when we have things in common. So that part is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We want to know that people that we are with think the same way we do. I mean, if we were here this morning, if, if we didn't all believe that Jesus Christ was the key to going to heaven and that he died on the cross for us, and someone really didn't believe that and they're sitting here, and that might, be, that might become difficult. They might start going, you know, well, no, I don't believe in any of this. Well, maybe you need a different church or no church, I guess, if you don't believe in God, but... Obviously, we, we feel that they need God more and more, even more. But Now, yes, that gets us into trouble and world wars and, and things like that. And people take th familiarity way too far. Like, hey, cool, he thinks like I do. And then, but the, the danger comes when there's an individual thinking into collective thinking and people just join along whether they believe it or not. We stop accepting people around us if they don't fit our criteria. That's where danger comes in. I can't understand your language, so I refuse to understand you. You don't see God exactly the same way that I do, so you're wrong. Like it, it just Some people make those jumps, and it, it's, it's not correct. Uh, you're a liberal. I'm a conservative. You know, it's just ridiculous. Let's just walk away from each other, you know, thinking politically. We don't need to think politically either. Humans invented, like I'm saying, the segregation that I'm outlying here, not God. But God knows us. He understands us. God wants us to make sure that our faith is built on the truth. And he wants to make sure that our faith is not sabotaged by someone that is against him. There's no question that we are to love and accept everyone no matter what. That is the goal. That's what Jesus did. Jesus never turned away non-believers when they wanted to listen to him. 
He never said, oh, okay, only those that believe in me stay, the rest of you can go. Don't tell me that, you know, groups of 3,000 or 5,000, every single one of them believed. But he never refused to speak with a non-believer. In fact, Jesus spoke his best truths when he talked to people that didn't know God. He really revealed himself. God does not turn away unless they choose to turn away from him. Even then, it saddens him. I know we're going to get into the, we're not going to get into the Calvinism, but he doesn't categorize people into just any categories. He loves everyone, and only two categories are out there. There are people that choose God and those that do not. But from God's end, he loves everyone equally. He still loves everyone, non believer, believer, equally. Now, that all being said, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the company of people that you have things in common with. I'm not saying that. I love all my friends. I usually, I love them for different reasons, obviously. One of my friends is a very funny person, and he makes me laugh. In turn, he lights up when I occasionally make him laugh. It's, it's tougher. But it, it forms a bond, and it's endured for many decades. I have another friend that's a very hard worker. He's the hardest worker person that I've ever seen in my life. He works hard, but he plays hard, I should say, relaxes hard. And that's where we meet. He's comfortable in his own skin and has a quiet reserve that I admire greatly. Being able to hang out with him is an absolute blessing. I can't tell you how many hours we bonded by a fireside for both of these guys or teaching Juana together, all these different things. Life is full of people that we do seem to click with, and that's okay. Some more than others. And it's a natural tendency to bond with people that we admire, think alike with, and have a commonality with. But the fact that my friends are also Christians with strong faiths let me know, lets me know that my loyalty and my friendships are well-placed. I feel good about them. God is that third strand in our relationship, just like it is with my wife or my children. Now again, I want to reiterate, because I don't want to be taken out of context here, that we can easily fall into sinful relationship traps. These always extend from our own sin and our wrongful ideologies. I'm sure the bond of the local chapters of the Ku Klux Klan were very close-knit. Most of them were all related, and they they stood up for each other. They are brothers in sin. We know that the Nazis all looked after each other and backed each other even to their deaths. They were on the same side. They agreed with each other. There's an honor among thieves. You've heard that. I'm not interested in any of those types of relationships. We're not talking about political or even extreme religious ideologies here. I want us to focus on the good kind of relationship, and I want us to see the kinship that we have with our friends and families, most especially when those friends and families are also Christians, like like yourselves. These relationships are truly special because they're built on, on God, they're built on truth, they're built on love. The relationships we should crave with each other should be based on the relationship that God wants with us. Love, honor, integrity, honesty, biblically based, God-like. All right, so we understand the ins and outs of segregation versus common bonds or political bonding. I am getting to something, by the way. Uh, Again, common bonds can be misplaced, bonding with people over sinful ideologies, but let's focus on basic, healthy, common bonds. We know that this is difficult to truly bond with just, it is truly difficult to bond with just anybody, okay? You can't just say, oh, right, go be friends with that person. That's sometimes difficult. Even if you're desperate to do so, it takes two people and common ground to begin a relationship. Now, let me explain this as an, in, a man, in an imaginary scenario. Let's say Tom Cruise is shooting a movie next door to your house. The doorbell rings, and Tom politely asks to use your phone. You're starstruck. Sure, come on in. After using the phone, you nervously and politely ask Tom if he wants a cup of coffee. Mind-bogglingly, he says yes. You sit and talk with him for two hours as he waits to go back on the movie set for his turn. He regales you with story after story about various movie sets. All movies that you and your wife have watched together and enjoyed. You hear funny behind-the-scenes stories on the set of Top Gun. That's your favorite movie. Stories about his three children, and he charms you, and you are starstruck. You are feeding Tom's ego, and you are pinching yourself because he's sitting right across the table from you. And he wants to be there. He hasn't left yet. 
Two hours with Mr. Mission Impossible himself, and after this magical time, he leaves and gives you his personal cell phone number and says, call me anytime. You've just made friends with Tom Cruise. Wow, that's great. He leaves. As soon as he leaves, you open up your phone and you start Googling him. You slowly find out that his worldview and his personality is much different than that two-hour portion that you spent together. He's a Scientologist that has nothing to do with God at all. It's not even, they call themselves a religion, but God is not involved. He's been married and divorced three times. He's estranged from his children, at least one of his children. One of his ex-wives talks a lot about fearing for her life from him. Uh, He's a strong advocate for his church, which completely negates any idea of God and downright criminal morality. They're very open about it, what they believe in, and some of it is very criminal. He has been reported as being arrogant, strong-arming kind of person, and downright rude. But hey, you don't care. Tom Cruise likes you. You loved him in Rain Man. He made you laugh in Jerry Maguire. We tend to lay aside morality or common sense when we can join the club, so to speak. Again, you feel special. Now, would you say that your bond with Tom Cruise here is a strong and deep bond or a surface bond that breaks when push comes to shove? Mr. Cruise is okay with being your friend until you try to go deeper. Mention God or how to have a a successful relationship and magically your contact number for him no longer works. For you to remain friends, you must feed his ego and agree to let him boss you around. Now, that isn't a real relationship, and it definitely isn't godly. God wants relationship with you, but he doesn't want you to be just starstruck. He doesn't want you to be, he doesn't want to boss you around. He loves you. He wants real relationship. I I don't want to say equal ground relationship. It's a little bit different with God. But what you would have with Mr. Cruz is completely different than what God is requiring. But if God were to just come down out of nowhere and just come to earth and walk around, we would probably stop and go, well, you know, it would be, you'd be starstruck. But then after a while, you'd be like, well, you know what? He's not going to stay anyways. This isn't really, he isn't really one of us. He made us and he's up there. And people fear him. And there is a healthy fear of God that we we have, obviously. And that's built completely out of respect and and love for him. But it's different. Our original relationship with God was perfect in the garden. Adam and Eve were living with God and God walked in the garden. And he walked with them. And he never demanded anything from them except for one thing. Don't eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. All good? Okie dokie, they said. Let's have live happily ever after. Then Satan started sinking his hooks into Eve. Started with Eve. Doesn't mean just because she's a woman has nothing to do with anything. Why was the first suggestion of sin? Why? Why can't you touch that fruit? Why? This was followed by doubt. What's the big deal? It's only fruit. Then it's justification. God loves us, me and Adam. So why would he place the restriction on us? All these things were going through Eve's mind, I'm sure. That's part of the temptation part. She hadn't sinned yet, just the temptation part. Then it's negating what was said, which is where the sin is created when she actually took the fruit. Disobedience. Then you feel guilt. She felt guilt and she wanted others to lessen her guilt. So here, Adam, try this. Adam refuses also to obey God's original rule. He eats the fruit. Now, two sins have taken place. Two sinners are created here. Finally, there's the denial, lying about the fact that you sinned. Of course, God knows all. The cycle was complete. The break happened. It began. The Coles notes of original sin was kind of basically, you can't tell us what to do. Selfishness. The desire for superiority over God. I want to know, or not, not necessarily maybe superiority over God, but I want to be just like God. God gave them everything, even their own life and existence. They had zero right 
to question anything, especially the fruit. But there they went, and there we find ourselves now guilty of original sin. People that sort of believe God don't want God to tell them what to do. I know some people, oh, they believe that yeah, there's probably something out there, but don't tell me what to do. Adam and Eve wanted more than what God offered them, which was everything except for the fruit. Selfishly and sadly, that's exactly what Adam and Eve dove towards. Didn't take very long for them to do that. God segregated them from Eden. Life became hard. Just one sin did all of that. Separation from God. God no longer walked among them. He couldn't. He couldn't be there with sin. Cain and then Abel were then born. Yay, children, go forth and multiply. Check. Oh, Cain doesn't want to offer God his best offerings. He's kind of phoning it in, as we would say. God's disappointed, but oh well. All God wants is our best effort. Cain gets mad and kills his brother and then lies about it with a snarky, am I my brother's keeper line? Ouch. Human existence wasn't very old yet, and we drove a wedge between us and God too far for us to cross. People and prophets come and go over the early years, and they all had one thing in common. That gap Adam and Eve wedged between us, or sin, I should say. I don't want to necessarily blame them specifically. But it's a, it's a gap that we cannot surmount. We cannot jump that gap. Only God can jump that gap. So what to do? So time marched on and people stopped calling out to God. Oh sure, they cried out when unimaginable things happened, like floods, slavery, exile. But they really didn't want a relationship with God. They just wanted help. They wanted the life preserver because they were drowning. But as soon as they were safe and sound on the boat, they'd go to the proverbial room and not talk to God. They refused. Ungrateful. We've all done it. We've all been there. The whole time humans refused relationship with God, God was desperately craving a relationship with them, with us. Once in a while, he would get it from people like Abraham, Joseph, David, you know, some people, some prophets, some, some godly people throughout the Bible. But every once in a while, a person would come along that spoke up for God. And that's where we get Isaiah, one of the prophets, one of the, just a person that was speaking for God. God was pleased with these individuals, but he still craved relationship with everybody. Everyone, regardless of skin color, homeland, or mindset. He wants nobody to perish and go to his adversary and that prison that we, that we know as hell. He wants all of us, past, present, future, to enter paradise and be with him forever. The problem is that we don't want saving a lot of the times. We don't want God. After a while, we stopped calling out for even the life preserver. They stopped calling out for help because they're already stopping to believe that that would even work. They stopped believing in the life preserver even. Oh, no one can help us. It's impossible. Well, we're, this is our fate. Then God decided to accomplish the impossible. That impossible gap must be crossed with another impossibility. God knew that the best way to gain our trust, the best way that we would ever accept that the ever-present, omnipotent, and all-powerful God the God, Yahweh, could ever remotely understand us and our tiny little lives, the only way to accomplish that insurmountable leap would be to become one of us. Now, impossible, right? That, that sounds impossible. God is God. God cannot stoop down to my level. Even if God, like I said before, would suddenly just come down and walk among us we might view that as he's on vacation. A parlor trick. Ah, God just showed up. He's just, he's play acting as a human. That must be fun. How nice for him. That's how we think, right? He wasn't born here. He's not an islander. He's not a Mennonite. He's not from around here. He's not a New Yorker. He's, he's not from around here. When he's tired of us and we will do something wrong, he will just leave us. He'll go back to where he came from because it's way better than here. Okay, so what if he could be born down here? 
What if he could be born here and be an actual islander? What if he would come as a baby? See, there was talk about that. Well, if he came down, would he come down as a man? No, he came as a baby. Fragile, vulnerable. He was a baby. He needed his mom and dad to take care of him. Now, he grew up in a poor, tiny little village. No crown, no riches, no earthly power that we saw at the time. Now, if we were talking to God about this before this happened, would that work? Sure, you'd say. But then the question would be, to what purpose? What would you do? Okay, so he comes as a baby, now what? He just lives his life and then leaves? Bye. Some people expected him to take Herod's crown and throne, become the king of the Israelites. Nope. Some people thought he would take Caesar's throne. Let's go bigger. King of the world. Nope. God knew to go even bigger than that. God knew that he had to take on the greatest purpose of all. To bridge that impossible gap. How to do that? Well, impossible tasks, like I said, need impossible solutions, it seems. What if God himself would go down to hell to break those gates chains. Okay, you'd say, all right, yeah, that would work. But don't you have to die first? Okay, we'll make that part of the plan. Okay, what else? Well, anyone who finds themselves in hell belongs and stays in hell. So that means if human God sinned, even once, hell would capture him. For the wages of sin is death. That's God's words. So, okay, that's easy. God cannot sin. So no problem. Human God will not sin. So this Emmanuel will be sinless. You're thinking, wow, if that's even possible. Yes, the impossible. But then you'd say, and some people, and, I, and I, God covered all the bases is what I'm getting at here. Every single possible thing you could argue against with Jesus was covered. So some people, I think, would say, well, if a human God can't sin, he's not really like one of us. He doesn't understand sin then. He's never been tempted. He would even have to be tempted for the plan to work. So, okay, fine. He's going to be tempted. He's not going to be just tempted by what you're tempted by. He's going to be tempted by the ultimate thing you could be tempted by. The whole power over earth and death, all of that, he will go into that temptation and he will come out perfectly with flying colors. Wow. Really? If you could talk to God, you probably would say, if you can do that, then you've solved that impossible problem of that gap. So guess what? I'm here to tell you this morning, it happened. Some people out there don't know what happened, but it happened. It happened exactly like I described it. God knew that the best way and only way to solve the sin problem, to rescue those who actually want to be rescued from sin, still our choice, would be for Jesus to become one of us. There was no questions from anyone that Jesus was human. He proved that. If earth was an island, Jesus was born an islander. He walked, he talked, he laughed, he cried, he ate, he rested. Like me and my friends, he sat around the fire with his familiars and he argued against the perpetrators and corruptors of the day. He stood up for us. He showed us how to live perfectly by example and by teaching. He didn't just come and go for nothing. He cured impossible health issues, including death. Not only for himself, but he also raised people from the dead. And he healed our relationship with God, which seemed impossible, insurmountable, can't do it, and yet it happened. There's no doubt that this man was our brother, but also our God. He was God's son. He was and is God. He was and is God's spirit. He is everything. 
and yet he's also us. He has bridged that gap. He is the bridge. He himself, God, became the bridge. He knew the temptation of sin, and he showcased how to overcome it, how to conquer it. He did the final conquering through the final act of selfishness. He allowed death to take him. He allowed that to happen because that was the final impossible feat to go to hell and escape it. Death allowed him to break hell's grip on us. He gave us a new avenue to pursue. He showed the way back to God. He shone his light on that path and he walked it himself. He took sin to the grave, died with it, holding on to it, and he smashed the gates of hell and therefore all sin with it to nothing. That special God blood washed it all away. The Savior became one of us, Emmanuel. Don't forget, it means God with us. Let's pray. Father, we are so honored and blessed to know what Jesus did for us. It's outlined in the book. The book is, is the word, and the word is truth, and it is your word your truth. Father, we are so thankful of what Jesus did. We're allowed to be free in him. We're allowed to be, like Neil was saying, we're allowed to be the light in the world. We're allowed to be the salt in the world. All because of you, Jesus. You are everything. We cannot stress that enough. We are nothing without you. We would just live and die and be in hell. But Jesus, we can accept you. We can accept our sin was in your hands when you smashed those gates and it's gone. And all we have to do is accept you, Jesus. And so many of us here today do. and So many people watching at home do as well. So Father, that is hopeful. That gives us a reason to get up in the morning. It gives us a reason to, to love that person beside us, that person we work with, that person that we see in the store, that person that we see walking down the street, that neighbor we can love because you loved us first, Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It wasn't just out of cleaning up sin or anything like that. It was all part of it. It's because, Father, you want relationship with us and we're thankful that you want relationship with us. And I'm thankful. I'm just blessed by that. And I just... Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing number 393 in the red hymnals. Take my life and let it be. Let's stand and sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of by love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not 
not a might would I withhold, not a might would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour, at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Amen. Thank you, Corny and Shirley. So for the benediction, I'm going to read out of Mark 16, uh, verse 19. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Peter being part of the initial part of just creating God's church and we're just a derivative of that today 2,000 years later so go out into your world and let people know that Jesus is among us have a good week